This guy was born. Get out of here. He Look at this little. Man. Wait, let's listen to that little buzz. There he is. He's a fat little booger. Oh my God. These are Western Diamondback. That, wait they a were, second, but albino? Are, these are albinos. Look at this. They are beautiful. This is a neotropical rattlesnake. That is awesome. Being bitten by this snake, or being, like, being bitten by a cobra and a fertile ant, all at the same time. You're going to lose something. The antivenoms do not feel good. Look at this. Simple. And now I can safely grab that water ball. Really well done. Oh, look at that guy. Yeah, most Ooh. of these guys have been here since 2012. Yeah. Here's a typical South Florida coral snake. You see the long red, the little yellow. These are typically found here. A lot of these came from Palm Beach County. Oh, right, right by me, man. Uh, yeah, I love, Jack just gets right into it. Uh, here with Jack Vicente, a friend of mine. Uh, this gentleman is, I, I, I don't want to insult, oh, I can't touch, but I don't want to insult you by saying old school, man. You are one of the original snake men here in Florida. You worked at the Serpentarium years ago, and now you have your own venom production lab, and that's what we're doing here today. Jack, to take us through, show us some of the animals he works with, and uh, we're going to learn a lot about venomous snakes and venom production, and just about the love you have for these animals. All right, there'll be no uh, exact order, but we'll go through Let's it. Just, we're right. just going to have fun, Jack. That's what we do. We sincerely thank all of you happy campers out there. Your support makes a real difference in our efforts here at Camp Kennedy. This week's shout out goes to longtime supporter, Rainy Parker. Thank you for all you do and for loving reptiles. All right, this rat, these racks are all full of uh, venom production coral snakes, the lower ones. Okay. Uh, you know, we, we get them at a small size. This this one here is a little typical, uh, about a 14 incher. Okay. That's that's a typical average. Now the reason that, what's the reason that you're so passionate about coral snake and coral snake venom and anti-venom? Well, actually in 2010, uh, when Pfizer Pharmaceuticals stepped up to the plate to produce a North American anti-venom because the old Wyeth product had long expired and they were using expired product on a, uh, a lot by lot basis where they would test it and say, okay, use this lot. Uh, anyway, Pfizer needed a large amount of coral snake venom and uh, they contacted George Van Horn with Reptile World and George got with uh, myself and Carl Barden and there's no way we could have ever produced that amount of venom uh, singularly. So we kind of separated out our colonies and uh, I built this operation here to produce uh, 100 grams of eastern coral snake venom for the production of anti-venom. Okay, that, was there, so what you're saying is there was a lull in actually that anti-venom? Yeah, yeah, the anti-venom was expired and running low. Oh, see that? So huh. now it's everywhere, uh, that ho it's everywhere that hospitals want to stock it. It's available. Uh, we're dealing with an orphan disease. Coral snake envenomations are less than 100 a year, probably less than 70 a year in Florida. And where you're we're talking seven to eight thousand envenomations in the United States from other snakes, it's a bad thing, but it's not a common thing. And it really, you know, everybody says, well, maybe we don't need the antivenom because it only affects that few of people. Well, that's great unless you're one of those people. Right, gotcha. Uh, and and my concern and my felt feeling was, it's it's wonderful to know that if a child gets bitten because they're they're primary with picking it up in the colors. Uh, this antivenom will not only save her life, it'll, if it's given in time, it'll keep them off a respirator. And then, Very uh, cool. So that, that's, that's the whole purpose of the coral snakes. Uh, we didn't realize we were going to have this much luck with them. Uh, these snakes eat other snakes in the wild. They do not eat mice. They very seldom will eat lizards. So we had to develop a way to force feed them and we tube feed them with a formula that we've played with over the years that allows them to grow at 84 degrees ambient temperature and still gain weight at a 21 day feeding schedule. That way you can feed and extract every 21 days. Because there is a little trauma with the, the feeding tube going down your esophagus if you're not careful and all of that minimizes and uh, the result is uh, these guys, have, most of them have been here since 2012 and they're breeding. Wow. In fact, we. Uh, I generally get about five to eight eggs on a coral snake. Okay. So what I thought was, well, let's do this. Let's pair two of the biggest corals I got. So I paired six giant corals, wanting to get a gene pool of big corals. So when they were hatched, I could start them easier, feed them easier and, and grow them. And uh, so oh, anyway, here is a result 
of two 37 inch snakes. Um, and much to my dismay, look at that. Instead of getting five or six <laughs> giant eggs, I got 18 small eggs. <laughs> Holy so uh, anyway, these are all looking good. They're plumping up. They're at about the 40 day mark. So what's the incubation on these? About 50 to 60 days. Oh, so wow. You know, ne never, never let them turn, but see there. Of course, yeah. He's looking good, but see how small they're gonna be? That's incredible. So anyway, uh, the other two um, pairs, one of them didn't take it all. And I have videos, they, they copulated. I know there was copulation, just no fertilization. Uh, and the, one, the other one that did lay, laid five infertile giant eggs. That's so cool, man. So anyway, we, we didn't... So you're uh, creating your own stock as well. Well, we're trying. It wasn't as successful this year as I had hoped, but we, we'll, we'll keep Keep it going. That. How long have you been involved with venomous snakes? Uh, since I was seven years old. Okay, can I ask how old you are now? 71. 71 years old. How cool is that, guys? So when I said OG, oh, uh, I really meant it. Um, and Jack's been very kind to me with his knowledge and also introduced me to Carl Barden. Uh, we visited uh, the Reptile Discovery Center as well, and that's because of Jack's uh, introducing us. And man, what an incredible group of guys. You, you know, this really cool passion project for you guys. And also you do a lot of education as well, which is why you like talking with us. Yeah, well, we do education. <clears throat> um, not as much as Carl does, of course, because he's got open to the public and he's educating people every day and he's big on school groups. He does a yep. fantastic job, Reptile Discovery He does, Center, man. Carl he's incredible. <clears throat> what we do is we'll go to like uh, do some forestry presentations and uh, do some sheriff stuff and uh, some of the people that uh, are in the wild or encountering snakes they want to know more about them and yep. what to do first aid type so we do we do that and we've also helped some of the universities uh, Dr. Darren Rakita up in FSU we worked with him on coral snakes because uh, they were the first to find out with the eastern diamondback that the venom was geographically different right now you've got some diamondbacks here don't you or these are speckled do you ha you're doing some work with eastern diamondbacks can you talk to us a little bit about what's going on with the venom because that's very interesting same species right yes yeah, so, different well, venom what's going on with that well what they found uh, basically is from the swanee river north there is a small basic peptide found in that venom that's a it, it, it's a pretty neurotoxic it's, it'll knock you down uh, and that that peptide is not so prevalent in the southern species so what that did is that enabled the antivirum producers to say well we when we inoculate the sheep because that's what they do with that that antivenom we need to make sure we have the, the correct percentage of that northern uh, toxin in there so if somebody gets bit up north it works gotcha well that started everybody thinking ever well if there's a difference in venom variation with a rattlesnake maybe other snakes have variation so Darren came to me and said, hey, we need your help. We know you got coral snakes from 28 counties. We've got them here, and we've got a bunch of them. We'll give you the coral snakes from the panhandle that we get, and how about you give us a venom sample from everything that you got so we can see if there's a variation. So I did that about three or four or five years ago, and uh, that paper was done. There is no variation with coral snakes. None. Interesting. Well, now the interest is Bill Hayes and Loma Linda is wants to see if there's a difference in a juvenile uh, born coral snake venom compared to a one year, maybe a two year to maybe a, a, a extreme adult. So I've gotten venom for, and all he needs is 10 milligrams, which is nothing. Okay. Uh, so we've got all of that, and then we will be getting venom from these neonates when they're born, and then he'll be able to see if there, you know, there there's is. an ontogenetic difference in the venom as the snakes grow from birth to growth. Uh, cool. Which is just all science. And you know, I get inquiries from kids and people and young adults that want to get in the venom business. And I'm going to tell you, if we didn't have, if I didn't have this Pfizer thing going here for coral snake, I, 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 I could not. You don't make money. Gotcha. That, that's paying the bills. And, and and with the way the industry's headed and science is headed, there's going to be other ways down the road. It might be 5, 10, 20, 50 years, but uh, venom collection is probably going to be diminished as far as necessity. Don't study the venoms. Study the animals. Keep the animals. Learn them. Uh, but that will spark and open doors into research, medical, science, zoo, husbandry. I mean, keep in mind, 
you know, snakes just, they're, they're, reptiles in general are neat. Snakes to me are the best. I love venomous, but I love all snakes. I got okatee corns, I got pine snakes, I got other stuff that's harmless too. And it's observation and it's looking and it's learning. And uh, I really hope that the current FWC situation doesn't uh, have to diminish the private sector again, like was going through several years ago in 2016. Right, right. Because to me, these young people, when they start out collecting, hunting, and learning about snakes and animals and reptiles and everything, that, that, that's, that's a basic building block to where they're going to be. That's how I started. Right. I started hunting with kids on bicycles in, in Everglades out of Hialeah. <laughs> So uh, what do we got here? Uh, what do we got here? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, I just want to see some this snakes. This is a little breeding pod direct. Actually, uh, going through with that. These are little white speckled rattlesnakes. Now these guys are pretty snappy. So you go, got go, it, go, buddy. Go. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah there yeah, you go. There you go. See. Woo! Where are these? Yeah, uh, right. Where are these indigenous? These are to? from Arizona. Okay. Look at this, guys. Yeah. This is a beautiful snake. What kind of habitat are these found in? These are very dry, arid, mountainous. These okay. come from the TA mountain range in Arizona. Okay. And uh, now here's a little one here. Th this one here is a two. This is a two-year-old. Now he's up on the mountain. Oh, yeah, he'll snap you too. I got gotcha. you. Okay, that's a two-year-old. How bad is a bite from one of these? Their bite is necrotic. It's bad. You will do fine with antivenom. Now these were born. Uh, these are one year the, uh, next month. This guy oh, was born. Get out of here. He Look was. At this little guy. He was born last September. And Wait, let's listen to that little buzz. There he is. He's a fat little booger. Oh my God, this yeah, thing is beautiful. Yeah. They have between two and three. Um, and in fact... Uh, two or three offspring? Two or three offspring. Of course, they're, you know... They're live bear. Live bears. This one here, um, I'm hoping this, this one here is gravid. And she is half half in her little container here, but she's looking a little puffy. And yep. it's hard to sex these guys from looks. You almost got to probe them, and I don't, I don't want to probe them. Right. Uh, we're not going to put them through that. You know, what we do is we we put um, eight of we have eight of these white things, and we put these together, all in a big cage for two and a half months. Really. And then we don't touch them. And then after that, we pull them out, we separate them, feed them, and watch them. And generally, we end up with one or two of the females. It's it's a, it's about four and four. Okay. Um, it's not you know, I've tried pairing them up one and one, and that hasn't worked well. So this this grouping works really good. That makes sense. Do you think it's something like sometimes there's competition that helps oh, with course. it? Of course, a lot yeah. of people put two males uh, to get combat. You know, and I've done that with a black uh, Crobus cerberus rattlesnake. Okay. Uh, and here's some offspring. I'll, I'll show you the bigger ones here. Okay. Um, these are. Western Diamondbacks. Oh my God! Uh, that, wait a second, but albino? Are, these are albinos. Now they're snappy too. Watch no worries. So. I believe uh, me. They, <laughs> we got you guys are on a GoPro. These guys are in their second year. He's in shed. See, see the color yep. in the eye? I do. Okay. And now uh, these guys were born with these last September. There's four Eastern Diamondbacks, and I'll show you the mother and father. Uh, two are albino and two are het because the mother is a het and the father is a pure albino. Okay. So here is an albino eastern. Beautiful. And here is a het. Oh, okay. Then, but wait, don't, before you do that, I just want to see him. Um, look at this. So that even listen, I love Mark guys. Up. God, are beautiful. They are beautiful. That's what I was just going to say. Yeah. It took the words, it took the words out of my mouth, mate. But um, let me tell you, you see these guys, you see how calm they're sitting here. Yeah. I mean, if you looked at those, you know, they're just going to sit there. But buddy, let me tell you what, when you get these guys out on a hook, you better have a bucket right here next to it because they're flying off the hook. These yeah. guys are a hook crazy. Okay. Uh, and, and one thing, you know, when you're dealing uh, at this height, anywhere from here above, you don't want to drop that snake. I mean, because when you snake. drop that snake, you can do untold damage to the spine, the vertebrae, especially the bigger the snake is, and not so much on the babies, but it's not good. So, uh, you know, well, what I do is I take this stool here, and I put my red bucket on it, and then go over here, and I go up and down, and then I, I got, if the thing gets away or yep. starts getting excited, we can put him right in a bucket and save the fall. Gotcha. Gotcha. And and again, guys, this is a this is a laboratory situation. This is a venom lab. Uh, so basically, you know, he uses the rack systems. I mean, sometimes people, you know, are like, oh, it doesn't have much space, and but this this is necessary 
because it's a controlled environment you're trying to keep here and safety is paramount. Safety, not just for you, but as you mentioned, the snake. These, these the, the westerns you saw, they'll be moving out of these. Or, you know, I, I, I want to keep them in a rack where the length of the rack is about, about the size. And yep. even though the FWC regulations are length and width is the cage. Um, but the reason for these racks, it, you can pull, this, pull it out, take the snake out. You can get the snake easier. You can clean it, you can disinfect it, they're plastic, uh, you, and you can just maintain uh, whether you want to use paper. And by the way, the reason we're doing paper on these guys is I'm running them through a, a series of fecal tests, uh, okay. making sure there's no parasites, and it's so much easier to uh, get the feces out of the paper than the substrate. Gotcha. Uh, but after that, they'll go back into a substrate uh, realm. Uh, what do we got here? Well, these are, these are two... Uh, Arizona black rattlesnakes, Crotalus cerberus, that I caught uh, actually with Ed when went out to Arizona uh, in 2000, I think, 8 and 10. Wow. And unfortunately, every Serb we have, when we have about nine of them, or eight males and one female, this is a female right here. Uh, and she copulated, and I'm hoping that, that we're going to have some success with her. Uh, I've never bred those before. These are two uh, uh, Ruber, uh, red diamondbacks from lower California area. That's a male and female. Look at this guy. And I, I breed these uh, every year. Wow. And we've, we've actually we got a, a one year old of these that I kept. This is a black tail Crotalus mollusus. And where is this one from? Uh, that one I think is, I think that one is from Arizona, northern Arizona. Gotcha. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. There's so many different, I, I never this knew it. This one was given to me. Yeah. So many different species of rattlesnakes, but oh, not, wow. only, not only in the United States. Oh yeah. They, they range into Central America, oh, is that you true? Get it, you get into, I'm seeing rattlesnakes now, I didn't even know existed. Some of these little wow. rattlesnakes are finding, and when you go into Central and South America, the Dorisus, uh, well, this is Crotalus uh, Dorisus terrificus is what I still call it, a neotropical rattlesnake. No, uh, I've never seen one. Look yeah, at the they, ridge. They, they, There's they, almost like a ridge. See the ridge and see the lines that go down the neck? Oh my God. Now, here's a subspecies of that one. That is awesome. This is, uh, this is, this is Crotalus culminatus. This is a baby. Um, oh. See also the ridge. Uh, this one actually came from Mark McCarthy down. Oh, there. down by me. Yeah, yeah, Mark's a great guy. Mark breeds these every year, and I was, that's beautiful. So and very this, alert snakes. Too. Yeah, yeah. Very alert. So not only are they looking at us with their eyes, guys, they can zero in on us uh, with those pits. Uh, yeah, let pit me tell you, when you're handling coral snakes and cobras, and you grab that snake and you watch where your hand is. The only thing you need to be aware of is where those fangs are, and you, you're familiar with their head movement, and to your benefit, it's a short fixed fang, it's not a movable long fang. Well, when you start handling vipers, Crotalidae pit vipers, uh, now you're dealing with long movable fangs you have to be careful of. I've seen fangs go through the bottom jaw, depending on how you're holding it. And what you also have to realize, when you open a cage, you can get in there and you can reach and you can maneuver a little closer to an elapid um, if you're careful but because they don't have the heat sensor pit when you open a cage of rattlesnake that guy knows your finger he knows the heat he sees your body and because of your size he's already on a defensive quicker mm -hmm. than a, the coral snakes you got to work hard to get bitten by a coral snake gotcha now, if you do get bitten, you got a problem, uh, especially. <laughs> and the one other thing we're doing is we look at the antivenom, and typically you will see one vial of antivenom, 10 milliliters, will neutralize two milligrams of coral snake venom. And the loading dose has been pretty much standardized to about five, which means they're saying, okay, five vials of antivenom for a coral snake will neutralize 10 milligrams. And we were thinking many, many years that the average yield on a coral snake is about 10, give or take a couple. And I've just done a year's worth of venom collection studies that I still got to put together where I took a colony of, I separated 50 of these snakes out from the smallest to the biggest every 21 days, extracted the venom, and then I kept that venom separate. And then for nine months, I weighed every one of those, and uh, I'm, I'm looking at the average yield on that colony to be 
way up in the high teens, wow. not, not 10, which is almost twice what we thought. Now everybody says, well, they're giant snakes. Well, there are some giant snakes, but there's some little ones. So if you take this as a worst case scenario, my feeling is if you get bitten by a coral snake and you know you got injected, you know you got a good hard bite, you never know how much venom. You can't wait for that because once the respiratory goes down, it's too late, you're on a respirator. So if you, if you got a good solid bite and you're sure of that, I, I would start with, with at least six vials of antivenom. Wow. Uh, it's a whole IgG, uh, which is a, an old type of antivenom that's not really uh, purified out. There's no fragments. It's the whole, the whole molecule, the whole antibody. So once you put that in, it pretty much stays in there. Your body doesn't clear it as quick as some of the newer ones. So there's no, uh, you're not going to waste it by putting it all in. Gotcha. Uh, you know, and, and of course there's several modalities that you could put in four and then wait two hours and put in another four. The, the point is don't put in five and sit back and wait and watch because what happens that one of the toxins in the coral snake is uh, presynaptic, which means the antivenom may not release it. Uh, once it binds to the receptor site, you know, you hear about receptor sites yep. now with COVID, ACE2 receptor. Well, once that toxin binds to that receptor site, normally when antivenom is in the system, it releases it. The receptor site, then okay. Once these presynaptic toxins bind, it stays there and the antivenom does not release it. So by getting the antivenom quick, it well, minimizes the damage. It minimizes the, the binding. It's, it slows the binding. And then maybe you will never get into a binding of those receptors that shut down your diaphragm. Uh, you're going to get the ptosis. You're going to get the slurring of the speech. You could get some excessive salivation. Those are neurotoxic symptoms. But, you know, that is followed by the involuntary shutdown. And, and that's and, the end. It, it, they can keep you alive for weeks on a respirator and you'll come out but hey nobody wants to be on a respirator for a week or two especially that's, a young kid that's the truth now so, you do have some more lapids here as well yeah this is a uh, I used to, we used to call this the egyptian cobra banded egyptian cobra it's now termed as a snouted cobra uh, it's it, it actually it it is one of the snakes that samir uses in there and i, um, and I got this in as a baby and kept it uh this is uh this that's, is a sahara rock viper uh, that's some of the some of the uh, vipers you run into uh, over in Afghanistan and that type of thing. But this is one of the few vipers, by the way, that lays a what does not have living young. How does that happen? And what? and and it can lay eggs twice a year, not just once a year. So multi clutches, but eggs. You know, it's yeah. so weird. Viper yes. means the Latin, right? Viva viva yeah. right? Yeah. Vivo paris. I never know how to say that, but yeah. live birth. That's so strange. Now the, there was no pits. This is not a pit viper. This is an old world viper. Okay. Uh, are most pit vipers new world animals? Uh, most pit vipers are new world, but you know, you, you get into the Asia, the, tr the tree vipers, they're still... Manche, still are manches, are manches, they're pit vipers as well? You know, I don't know that. I don't know either. I don't, I don't I, think so. I gotta ask Tommy yeah, Crutchfield Tommy on that one. <laughs> uh, that I don't know. Very uh, cool. Now, this guy gets twice his size, by the way. They okay. Get very big, very voracious feeders. Uh, whew. Wow, it's a cool looking snake for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's different. Definitely. But back down to Mexico, this okay. is a Mexican green rattlesnake. You know, this has the same uh, a neurotoxic type uh, uh, activity in their venom as do the Dorisus, uh, the other ones down there. This guy's from Mexico. Wild. Uh, and they get very big too. Uh, they, they, they easily go six feet plus. I see some... Uh, uh, yeah, these healers. are some, yeah, we got two healers in here and two healers in here. Uh, they're, they're, and they're not paired up. They're just, uh, these are kind of residing here. And yep. Uh, and then we've got three, three healers here. Beautiful lizards. Um, <clears throat> I took the water out for your visit. Gotcha. Beautiful lizards. Uh, yeah. Ran into one of these wild. Yeah, and uh, oh, just God. they are like you know the icon of the of the Southwest. All uh, but and, one of these, uh, one of these came from Steve Angeli. It's Chip. The rest of these were born in captivity. Gotcha. And you you recently absorbed uh, within a year. You absorbed another collection, right? Is that what happened? I did uh, a lot of these are here on loan. For, okay. Uh, for a good friend of mine that uh, just needed to take a, a little break for a while. Gotcha. And, uh, no worries. Uh, actually, these healers are those. Um, this is a, a typical puff adder here, but it's a little, it's one of the yellow phase. 
That yellow phase originally came from uh, Rick Halpin, who started that uh, in Miami. Wild. And then this guy, this is an interesting snake. This, bit, being bitten by this snake would be like being bitten by a cobra and a fertile ant all at the same time. The hemolytic, cytotoxic, necrotic effects of this venom are horrible. You're going to lose something. The neurotoxicity will knock you down, and this snake, the antivenoms do not work for it. Uh, doesn't cover it. Oh, doesn't man. cover it. Now, and this is the theory, a spitting cobra? This is a zebra cobra, Naya nigra cincta, not Naya nigra cinctus. That's the spitter. Okay. This, this is a spitter also. Um, and um, we sent some of those samples out just to look at. Bottom line, uh, Innocent Pharmaceutical, who makes a lot of African antivenoms, is going to produce an antivenom. Their next batch will have this and will have a burrowing Actric Aspis in it. There's no antivenom for Actric Aspis, which is the mole viper, which has the fangs that extend beyond. You can't pick that snake Wait, up. is that the stiletto snake? Stiletto snake. Oh, yes, man, sir. you guys got to Google that. I wish we had one oh, to show you. That, boy. I've seen, I know a guy, Yeah. Mike Clarkson, oh, got know. envenomated oh, yeah. by, by that snake. So what happened? Oh yeah, They're not horrible. pretty. I mean, you know, the mortality rate on that snake's a little nothing, but buddy, I'll tell you what, you wish you were dead. Yeah, now that's a fossorial snake, right? It's an, a burrowing snake. Yes. That's why I call it the mole snake, right. I guess. Right. Uh, but, it, you know, similar um, similar kind of behavior to a to a coral in the way that it's a little bit subterranean. subterranean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 their venom gland extends down. You know, they have an elongated venom gland. Uh, I remember when Bill Haas got those. And he picked one up and he got bit. Of course. And, oh. and, and he just, we didn't know why. And and he w he had some immunity, but he lost a little tissue. And then he tried it a second time and he got bitten again. And then he figured out, uh, I mean, nobody knew back then what the fang structure was like on that snake. Nobody knew what it was. I mean, uh, that, that that issue even was present. Wild. Uh, wild. Yeah, they can, They the reason, and the reason they have that ability is because if you're in a burrow, yeah. you don't have the ability to open your mouth. No, they can bite sideways. That's and jab so it. crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we're, we're going to have to, hey, Tom, please go ahead and get us a, photo of the mole mole snake mole uh, mole, mole viper, viper. mole viper yeah. uh it's pretty cool all yeah, right yeah these are uh <laughs> these are some oka teas. yeah there you go some corn snakes yeah, we got some yeah. eastern diamondback peeking out right here there, yeah. but you got some eastern diamondbacks in the other room yeah that's a mother and father of the ones, the I ones we just, let's go have a look let's at those guys yeah this is just a lot of fun. I love getting over here. It's been about six years since we uh, hung out together. We're always, well, we've seen each other, but just not at his facility. And uh, this is a whole new room for you. Yeah, this is a whole new room. This, uh, this is, uh, that's the male Eastern that paired up with this female Eastern. That's the, that's the head and the albino. Oh, Those right. are the four Eastern Diamondbacks at the bottom rock we looked at where we had two albino and two head. Gotcha. Uh, now the Westerns that you looked at in there that were uh, on their second year, here's a mother and father to, to those. And this one here has got a little growth in his neck, which we're gotcha. gonna have to probably do. He's feeding, doing fine. But uh, I'm not sure what that is. And until we get the histiopath on it, we won't know. There's the other and one. And now this one, I'm hoping that she is grabbing. Uh, and she has been very lethargic and just kind of taking it easy. This is a yellow rat snake <laughs> that my wife Sally caught in the back porch about five years ago. That's a beautiful snake, and my it's, God. it's unusual. I don't know if it's got a little red rat in it or what. It reminds me of the old uh, uh, rat snake we used to catch, uh, the, the, you know, the Ross Allen eye. Yeah, yeah Ross thing. Allen, man. But, uh, wow. Now, and then these are, <clears throat> remember the speckled I showed you? Yes. The, the white specks? Yes. This is a normal color phase speck. That's the, that's a normal. Uh, protobus, Not as white. Protobus Michelin pyrus. But still beautiful. Salmon color, yes. And that's an adult. Um, so those white specks are a locality? They're a locality. The, the theory behind it is they live up in these white, sandy, mountainous range, and it's just blind you, and there's rock and crevices, and, uh, that's over the thousands of years they have turned white maybe wow. for protection but let me tell you another thing and anybody that's listened to this this they might want to hear this there's always been a problem with those white specks from that area regurgitate 
they'll eat, and they don't regurgitate in a day or two. They'll regurgitate maybe on day six or seven or eight, and they'll regurgitate a partial regurgitation, so they absorb some nutrients. They will do okay. They continue to grow, they breathe, but they all have this regurgitation problem. If you keep them in substrate, you won't notice it. It looks like a defecation. It's that small. Well, I was listening to Bill Hayes do a presentation at Venom Week, and, and one of his PhD students went out to that range, and they took fecal samples, and they found, we, we know they eat a lot of lizards. Okay. Uh, and, and, and see, we're feeding them mice, because they, they don't eat our lizards. They might eat lizards that we get from there. And they eat, they, they're voracious feeders, they eat. Well, two theories. It may be too much protein, too much fat, too rich. Maybe that's why they let it go. Uh, I tried hairless mice, didn't make a difference. Well, what they found is that about 30% of their diet is birds. No. And I'm thinking, you saw the size of that little rattlesnake. Well, there's a small species of quail out there. So I just bought some uh, day-old quail from Rodent Pro, and on the third feed of quail, no regurgitation. Interesting. Now, I don't know if this is going to continue, but... This is anecdotal uh, evidence at the moment, but well, still. We are, the story is don't put water in with them. Only water them once a week or twice a month. They don't need water. I've tried that. It didn't make a difference. Wow. Um, so, anyway. That's really cool. See. No, but that's great stuff. You know, there's yeah, husbandry. Yeah. There's always... That's why we come together and we learn from people who've done more than us. Or, or have... You, you get, I always say this. You got to really pay attention to your animals. Yeah, you do. You know what I mean? You got to, what they'll tell you everything they need. Yeah. And then it, you get to be a sleuth. You get to be a detective and try and figure out what's going on. So you got an animal that has evolved to look a certain way, but they also evolved to eat a yeah. certain way. Now this is another Arizona black. Oh, that's a, that's a pretty typical, nice colored one. I love these things. Uh, yeah, I can tell. <laughs> uh, I, I, now this is a Proglis. <coughs> It's either Crowless Stephen's Eye or Crowless Mitchell Eye Stephen's Eye. And I've been reading lately that may do away with this that it's not a subspecies. Let me tell you what is different. These snakes get big and they're snappy as heck. I see that, yeah. And that, that is not a Crowless Mitchell Eye Pyrus to me. Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, yeah, Crowless Pyrus maybe is what we're going to move to. Uh, so amazing. This is definitely cool. Like, this is more rattlesnakes than you've had in the past. Yes, more rattlesnakes, yes. Yeah. This is a, uh, a gaboon. A gaboon. Yeah. Wow. There you go, folks. And this is a bigger gaboon. He's a little snappy. That's the one I've had forever. Uh, actually, that one was born at Georgia's at Reptile World uh, in 2011. Wow. That's awesome. And, uh, and this is um, this is another yellow puff. Whoa! That's a gaboon? No, that's a puff. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. I was good. I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 interesting. You can really see the high yellow. It's gorgeous. Yeah. It's gorgeous. And even from here, you said watch your watch your fingers because oh, they. Oh yeah. The the vipers have a, a much better strike oh, uh, yeah. range. Uh, I'm gonna have you stand back. This, you got this one's a little. Uh, I'm gonna show you there, but these racks, by the way, they go way. See oh, how I see what you mean. Yeah. All right, look at that. Shoot over high. You see that snake? Looking at it. Yep. All right. Same snake. They change colors. What? Yes. They will lose that light and go to this. This snake and tomorrow could look like that. In a, day? In, in a day, so they have some chameleon-like yes. aspect to their skin. They do. Wow, they certainly do. And I, uh, we thought it was linked to humidity, but I'm not finding that to be the case because the humidity it stays pretty much. Look at you see them coming out. I do. Whew. You uh, you've always got to be on your toes, Jack. Yeah. Well, look. Uh, the other thing we do, you see the snakes of this size, and yeah. you see they're they're so high up, like this guy. You got to be very careful moving them with, with big, big hooks. Uh, and the fact that these have bred, like I've not moved this guy. And what I've done is I, I, I made these, these cheaters, if you will. Uh, like I can take this one and I can open this and I can set this in here and lock it in. Okay. Clean half the cage safely. 
move the snake over, and then clean the other half. And so Pretty when good. I did it on that one, I started thinking, well, you know what? Now I got, I made these, uh, because if, if the cage is clean, and, and all you're going to do is change the water bottle, um, I, I would not even reach in and change that water bottle. No way. That got <laughs> dedicated. So I made, you know, actually it goes this way. Look at this. Simple. You know, like that, and now I can safely grab that water ball, but that snake's not going to get out of it. Really well done. Um, and really it, well and, done. And, and, and you know, it just speeds up some of the cleaning process. Yeah, you know, so many guys, you know, I, I know people love to be shocked and you love to just see interaction with these animals, but when you are working with these animals day in and day out with hundreds, you have got to minimize the risk because yes. you have been envenomated. You've been bitten. Yeah, too many times. And I, you know, the people that can brag are people that have done this and never been bitten. And, and let me tell you, that's that's not impossible. I know a lot of people that are in that category. Uh, well, not a lot, but I know but there people. are some people. Yeah, and, and and you can't blame the snake. It's when you take a shortcut or you get in a hurry. Uh, even with these, you've got to be careful. If you don't have if you don't have the corner nice and tight, I mean that, that yeah. you know you, you got to be careful with that too. Gotcha. And this serves a purpose to a degree. Uh, but you know, at least once a month we take the snake out. We change the bedding, and we just pretty much have standardized on a 10% Clorox. Uh, that kills most everything. Uh, some of the crypto sodium stuff you might need ammonia or dioxide. But uh, and we're, we're, I'm doing fecals now a little more regular. Uh, I got a lab here in Kissimmee. The state lab is wonderful. I was doing my own, but when you don't do it every day, you can miss stuff, especially when you're trying to float, you know, over. And I can take a, a 10 people over there for 15 bucks a people, and I'll get a report in two days telling me exactly what's in there. Then I know I'm okay. Uh, you'd be surprised how many parasites are normal, and, and it's a normal load. Right. Uh, it's particularly salmonella in coral snakes. Uh, if it's low growth, that's normal. They do fine, but you can't treat it anyway. The minute that snake gets another problem, I had one with cancer. Uh, we had a necropsy on that. And I did a fecal. Well, that snake got so poor, and as soon as the snake gets poor, salmonella count gets heavy. Right. So, Makes sense. Um, and you know, everybody's worried about salmonella because when we do, when I do corals at the end of the day, I do an 80 corals. I got these here. I don't even take my clothes in the house, Sally. I wash them out here in my, yeah. my shop washer with Clorox, uh, and that's why <clears throat> a lot of my shorts and have spots white on them. But yeah. it's okay. But the oh, bottom no. line is, you wash your hands and don't put your hands in your mouth when you're cleaning cages and handling pieces and that type of stuff. Because some of this stuff is zoonotic. You can get it. You can get some of these parasites. There's gotcha. no doubt about that. All right. Uh, so well, I, I got to tell you, man, we just, I think we've been talking now for about, whoa, oh, almost 40 minutes, man. This is a big episode, guys. Need to cut it down, it's way too long. Well, we might cut some out, but there's so much good information, man. Okay. Um, and that's why I love letting it roll with you because. I love learning from you. This is how I do it, guys. You Fine. want to do a one-minute venom processing overview, and then you can. Do you want to do that? Yeah, real quick. All right, let's do you. it. Here the snake is taken from here. Uh huh. I'm not going to go do it. We put it here. We catch it. Yep. <clears throat> the venom is extracted into a into a vial that is kept in this machine that keeps this vial at 48 to 50 degrees, so the venom's never at room temp. <clears throat> After we're done collecting, it'll go in here and we spin it. And then when you spin the venom, at the very bottom, you get a little knot, a little hard. That's, that's like muscle drag or tissue or stuff you don't want. You take the pure venom off of that. that then you take that pure venom and you put it in a vial. this it'll go okay. in a vial and then you take that vial of raw venom and you dip it in acetone and dry ice or 91 percent alcohol and you spin it and what it does is it shell freezes around the outside of the glass and then you seal it up with a filter you take this frozen venom goes over here on this lyophilized and freeze drying machine here like this and it will sit there. This draws down a very low vacuum and at very uh, minus 50, 60 degrees. And then all the water is pulled out and accumulated around the coils. Yep. 
And then when you're done, after about 12 hours of lyophilization, uh, you pull that off. This is raw venom that's fixing to be freeze fully dried. And then the end product is... There you go. It is a white powder. This, see the white powder, yeah. yellow powder. It's yellow or white, depending on if it has a certain color. And that gets sent out to Pfizer, and they make the anti venom. That is sent out and sold. We weigh it by the milligram, and it's sent out and sold by the milligram. And there you go. That's a, pro that's a process. He's like the uh, Venom Heisenberg, if you've ever watched Breaking Bad. It's like uh, a. We're, in, we're almost through that. In all these years, I've never watched Oh, it. it's the best show ever, man. Sally and I got to look. It's Whoa. great. It's almost as good as this show. Okay. All right. I'm nowhere the chemist uh, that, you know, George George is a super chemist. Well, no worries. He actually fractionates it, and, uh, you know, Carl, Carl, and Carl does the same thing. You know, there's really not a lot of us around, uh, and probably because economically it would work. Right. But, uh, it's a close knit community. It is, and it's a passion project. And thankfully for the gentlemen involved in this, the public is safe. So if uh, if it weren't for these guys, snake bites would be a whole lot worse in this country. Set us back about a hundred years, I'd say. Uh, anyhow, guys, I gotta I gotta get going. Yeah. I just want to say thanks so much to you, Jack. I love you. Okay. You're a great man. We'll wash our hands. We will wash our hands, <laughs> and uh, thank you so okay. much. Amazing information, guys. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Uh, if you want to learn more about Jack, we have another video we did a few years ago. You can check that out. Uh, in the meantime, I'll see you guys later. So long.